So ladies and gentlemen, we are here in the front room of someone you will know yeah. as example. We now know you as Elliot. I know, I know him as L. Yeah. He said I can call him L. This is quite a surreal experience for both Darren and I. We met yesterday. Hearing your voice in real life is, is quite interesting because it sounds exact, funnily enough. Like my songs. Yeah, it sounds like your songs. <laughs> people always say that though because I think a lot of people um, put on a voice when they sing. Not that... Like, I mean, the classic example is like Adele. We ca- we've got to be careful what I say because she's a mate. But, <laughs> you know, Adele's like, oh my God, thanks everyone. Oh my God. Yeah, you know what I mean? She's, she's from Tottenham, isn't it? Uh, yeah, she's Tottenham and then Brixton, I think. But And then obviously when she sings, she's like, oh Lord, yeah. it's like the best voice in the world. That's, right. That's what James does when he's on screen. <laughs> Put on the voice. Put on the posh oh, voice. Oh yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. Make it 10% posh. So look, today I'm talking about what it's like to be from Windsor. <laughs> Calorie deficit. <laughs> calorie, yeah, cal- calorie deficit. Cheap meals. It's I, a fucking meal. Sorry, it's a fucking meal. We're, uh, we, we've are we just come downstairs from uh, listening to your new songs. Yeah, man. You look. You both look genuinely excited. I know you can both act a bit because I've seen you on your stories, but you both look genuinely excited. Hey, I'm buzzing for it. I'm not going to lie. I was like, am I going to have to fake being excited? <laughs> he's put, he's put I'm, like, I'm in his house. He's bought us breakfast. Oh, yeah, big man, we're going to have to fake getting excited for this. But the tune, <laughs> all three that you showed us was banging. Yeah, really good. Thank like, you. First one, I'm, I'm excited for you. Thanks, man. You, you know why I'm excited? There's going to be one I'm going to be listening to IB for. One while I'm driving to Tottenham to see my family. One I mean, whilst you're... Doing the business, love, <laughs> one more doing making the good, love, good. <laughs> Make, making love, you know, <laughs> one doing the good, good. I'm excited now because I know where all the drops are. So when we're behind the decks with you <laughs> yeah. in, in various parts of my beta, I'll beat the crowd to it. Yeah, I thought we'd so, give it five minutes before we hint that, but I'm glad you did it. Could be a few years before we get to our beta, though, right? We might just have to be all the gigs that we do in Sydney and oh, Brisbane because I'm going to come on tour with you now. Yeah. Oh, yes, and eventually you'll creep into and you'll come to me. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. there'll be a part of my show where you guys come on and dance, yeah. <laughs> there'll be a part of your show where I come on and like just act like a dickhead for five minutes. You know, you know, when you said that could be a few years to IB for, does that upset you at all? It does actually, because last year I had, um, I was, do you know, the craziest thing is I was one of I felt like the luckiest artist in the world last year because I played the last completed tour in the UK before COVID, oh, snap, which yeah. was finished March the 7th. I landed back here March the 10th, yeah. And then I played the first gig back anywhere in the Western, sorry, the Eastern Hemisphere, but the Western world in Darwin last that was October. Crazy. Is that the video so you I played sent the first me? and last. I sent oh. you the picture because you, you, you were like, your caption said, yes, this is... This, Actual, is not, this was yesterday, not yeah. this isn't a throwback. But last summer I had 27 festivals cancelled. So the, obviously the first thing that upset me about that was that my manager, um, who's got two kids, and my DJ over in the UK who's got two kids both had newborns actually last year weren't going to earn you know oh. they're you know because they get a percentage of what I get Yeah. so okay. I, I lose all this money alright I can still eat for a few years you know what I mean yeah yeah but yeah. they're like they're relying on me okay. so, this is, so when they, people see DJs and, or artists or rappers or whatever like man I've had all these gigs cancelled and then uh, their followers are like what are you complaining for man you're a millionaire but, but, like they don't realise all the people behind the scenes your lighting guy your sound guy and then some of them obviously just have bills to pay, but then there's other ones who have kids and yeah. they're like my best mates. They're like my family. Yeah. And I'm over here in Australia thinking, what can I do to earn some money to give these guys their yeah. percentage back home? So that was the first thing that real, really hit home. You know, after the fact that it's like, obviously I love being on stage. Yeah. Um, and even, so 2019, I flew, babe, how many times I go back? Like 10, 11? Yeah, well. That's my wife. She says Hi. Um, so she's, yeah. she's outside making sure that nothing's said that shouldn't be said <laughs> <laughs> so I feel, I feel like she's she's a gatekeeper and like if she sits forward on that comfy looking chair you're like guys you know the side eye innit yeah. um, the side eye well mate you've made her do about 100 hip thrusters today so she's you're welcome weird, weird that you you're chose welcome. that one weird, you're yeah, welcome yeah, <laughs> but yeah um, yeah answer your question I did really yeah it was I missed being on stage and, and I'm I don't know when the next tour of Europe's going to be which is quite sad and scary at the same time. Yeah, it's it's a strange one, isn't it? Because even if you were to say the COVID-19 thing was to be handled to a point, this it's still not going to be the same as it's ever been. And there's going to be so many legislations around crowds, mm. uh, big amounts of people coming together. Um, well, I heard that like even in the UK, say if they start... So I was meant to be playing Creamsfield last year, which is <coughs> I think 80,000 people or something. Then it got moved to this year. 
obviously I don't think that's going to happen August bank holiday um, and I don't know if I'd be prepared to quarantine for two weeks and not see my kids for those extra two weeks as well because oh. um, I might be in say UK for two weeks and then come back quarantine for two weeks it's, it's like it's all those things to think about but they're saying now that even when they do open like say sporting events with more than 5,000 people or music <coughs> events you're going to have to go up and show proof that you've been vaccinated obviously there's loads of anti vaxxed dickheads anyway so how's that going to affect it? Are people trying to sneak in? How is it going to be people who've got the fake vaccine? Because you know what the UK is like, how yeah, fuck yeah, that is. Yeah, yeah. You fake know, people, papers and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah fake yeah. papers or whether it's a chip or is it part, attached to your driver's license? I don't know. But there's all these things to get over. And then it's going to be, will the first cream fields, which is meant to have 80,000, just have 8,000? And will it just be three stages? You know, so how's that going to feel? They might have to segment, like, segment things where like drum and bass, house you mm. know and actually have mini festivals where like thursday is going to be for ten thousand people yeah house. yeah yeah friday ten thousand people r&b which do you know what because the last time i went to love box i used to i loved it five years ago i went i was like it's the best day of my life i went a couple of years ago and they'd put too much in one place yeah, yeah and yeah. We, we were it was busy it took us 90 minutes to get to the point where you show your ticket and get in and oh. you're like there's an hour and a half of my day and especially if you've dropped which but I, th I think they're probably, yeah. um, I think it's probably because they're searching the amount of people with knives going into festivals. Yeah, it's yeah. just crazy. It's like, this is a place we're going to have fun, but some people obviously feel the need to, to protect themselves. Why do you look at me when you said knives? <laughs> dickhead. It's such a dickhead. Um, I saw you eating lunch. I saw how you held your knife. <laughs> In the back of his hand. Yeah, but they, they were searching everybody. And then, but then what's stupid is everyone knows in those situations, people are giving it to their girls to sneak in. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a real shame because festivals for me, I I didn't go to my first one until I was in my early 20s. I didn't get into, I was the same. I didn't get into house music or, and I didn't appreciate what was going on. And do you know what? I'd be open about it. First time I tried MDMA in Ibiza, I was like, I get it. And then yeah. a dance floor wasn't just a place for people to dance. It was a collective of people. Mm. And it, it is escapism in some form or another, but you know, people get that in the pub down, you know, all bar one on yeah, a Friday yeah, night. Yeah, yeah. They're doing it with 10 pints of lager. You do it being sensible with, you know, MDMA. And I didn't even try MDMA until I was 23. Yeah, I was 23. And I was living in Bondi. Mate. So wow. I'd grown up in England, but it was always really taboo. It was like most people I grew up with smoked weed because um, it was part of their culture or <laughs> yeah. sold Coke, but I never even really came into contact with it in my, until yeah. I was 23. I yeah. said to, I remember talking to my teammates and being, they were saying they took it the weekend, had a great time. I was like, look mate, I, I want to know what it's like, but I'm scared. Can we sit at home and do it on the sofa? And my mate was like, no. He was like, that would be the worst yeah, yeah. first time ever. And I was actually playing rugby in Ibiza, at Ibiza 10s. And, um, <laughs> is that a thing? Yeah, it was a little... There's a load of fucked up <laughs> rugby players. <laughs> this thing, they left... Cuddling each other. <laughs> yeah. The day before we went to Ocean Beach. Oh yeah. And, um, a friend of mine went outside and met another friend of mine from uni. And next thing you know, he's coming with a packet of cigarettes. And I was like, why have you got a cigarette? Why are you not? And he's like, it's not got cigarettes in it. And uh, <laughs> I, got a bit, I got a bit peer pressure. What is it? Chewing gum? And I did, I did, uh, don't be a hero, do a half, did a half. And I'm in Ocean Beach. And I'll never forget, first time I ever came up on MDMA, uh, I asked a girl that was on the table next to us if she could put sun cream on my back. So I'm getting sun cream rubbed on my back and I was just like, holy Jesus. And, and me at that point, my first thought was, how have I been drinking for so long? And this isn't me advocating drug use. Well, it kind of is, but I'm not telling you to go away and do it. But for me, I was like, we went out, we, we had such a, a loving, meaningful experience with everyone. Uh, no one got trashed, no one got wasted. We well, all is pretty together. safe as well. It's yeah. just, I think, because when, when anytime people have flip out on that is because they've drunk too much because you think you're dehydrated yeah which is how that what was her name leah betts died i think of the you know the ecstasy tablet most most deaths were caused people thinking that they were thirsty yeah like over flooding their system over flooding their system but other than that it's way safer to take than fucking ketamine and cocaine and one of the kind of main things that i would love to see what we should be learned from europe is like a control of people in in amsterdam it's how many you have on you yeah, yeah. And then when you show the bouncer what you've got, you say, okay, mate, be careful of this one. This one's currently reported to be a lot you know stronger. In, you know, in Portugal, it's legal to buy it. Yeah. So I didn't really? realize this. And so I, I played a festival in Lisbon about five, six years ago. And I think my lighting guy, who's a, a, you know, he's a bit of a ledge. He's, lo he's, lo he's got one leg. <clears throat> um, and he's just an absolute fruitcake, you know. But one of the best lighting guys in the world. It's like which you kind of need, maybe you need to be off your face to be really good at lighting. But he just came back and he just showed us everything he'd bought. He had all sorts. And I was like, 
where the fuck did you get that from? He's like, on the street. It's like, what? He goes, yeah, you just go up to someone, like someone gives you a signal and then you just walk around the corner and do a legal drug deal on the street. Oh, that's mad. And then since they've introduced legal Class A buying in Lisbon, all of a sudden, it's not cool and edgy and dirty to do it because for a lot of people, it's the process of ordering yeah. it and buying it and picking it up, which is the excitement. It's yeah, as, yeah, as yeah, exciting yeah. as that doing it. Yeah. So as soon as like, it, it was readily available, they found that under 21s, the use was down 70% for Class A drugs because they were available everywhere. People would just pick and choose when they wanted it rather than putting all their emphasis on, oh my God, I've oh, had four we beers. It's, uh, yeah. We're going to plan it. It's going to be, be a big one yeah, Friday. Yeah, yeah. When it's available all the time, it's like, you know what I mean? It's like McDonald's is always open. If you fancy McDonald's, you got to go and have one, but you don't necessarily want to go there all day, every day as yeah. a dirty thing. And I think it's like the McDonaldization of drugs that they've kind of I'm, done over there. I'm still... I'm still waiting for the moment I drop one. I'm scared. I'm, a, I'm, I'm scared. I like it too much because I'm. I feel like my life is a real. I've only known right you now. two days, and I think you'd really like it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm like, this, I'm, I'm at such a high right now. I'm like, if I go any higher, I'm, I'm worried I might seek that all the time. <laughs> Do you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So then I'm like, am I not going to enjoy going out without anything now? That know? is a worry. It's an interesting one because uh, Portugal decriminalised it. Oregon and America have done the same. I what, still what, weed or class A? Oregon have d decriminalized everything. Wow. When the swap over went from Trump to Biden, uh, they put forward a movement. So yeah, Oregon is now decriminalized everything. The reason they say it's not legal is to criminalize this. There's no penalties for having drugs on you. Okay. Whereas I'm pretty sure dealing is still uh, not allowed. So that even though it's legal to have pills on you, you're not allowed to sell them. And actually, Dr. Carl Hart that was on Joe Rogan a couple of weeks ago said, Spain never criminalized drugs. So... Spain never decriminalized, but they've never criminalized. So you actually can have drugs on you in Spain, but you're not allowed to deal. I swear there's coffee shops in like Barcelona. You go buy it, you need yeah, a yeah. license or something but like that. Yeah, yeah. Then this makes sense because in Ibiza, I've always been very, very worried, but the police don't really care. And then I've heard about a few people that, you know, get caught dealing. It makes sense that that's the party island. You do it on a Spanish island because yeah, yeah. it's not yeah, criminalized. Yeah, 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 yeah. And... Um, it is, like you say, it's own little... And do you know what? The main concern for me isn't so much what people are doing. It's what the middlemen are stepping on stuff to keep it profitable. And, exactly. Uh, what, what they're adding to it. Yeah, and I think that, that if you could tax it and do quality control, you would have... You, you've, crime rates would drop for, for a start, like you saw in Portugal, because there's no more well, That's the difference. Team. I mean, look, it's not like you can buy MDMA and know it's 100% MDMA, <laughs> but you get that powder yellow brownie powder whatever. So, so but, yeah but mdma you know usually they haven't cut it with other stuff whereas yeah. when you're buying ecstasy in that tablet you don't know if there's a form of acid in there or speed or all these you know the chinese were known for doing their versions of everything weren't they that's when that was it mcat came in yeah which was basically plant food and it was meant to give you the same high as cocaine but it cost 10 pounds a gram rather than 50 pounds a gram What's the, and now uh, they're adding all these all these substitutes that are in ecstasy okay. that the dutch you know pretty much invented i'm, I'm sure was it yeah, well there was so. i think originally all the ecstasy tablets were coming from holland and then the chinese started replacing certain things with their fake version of it yeah their fake chemical and then people that's when they were having deaths as in that's a bad batch of pills because is it is it MDMA plus speed plus um, you know uh, acid or forms of that and then they're putting GHB in them to make people well, mixing feel, it all up. Well, yeah, all in a, a pill. Yeah, so like there's a thing in the UK that one of my mates set up and he's a festival promoter and it's you can go in and have your drugs tested at the festival. So my really? mate set that up. So you can just go in there. even if the police are nearby, you can yeah. be seen going into this tent and you can say right, I'll, you have to take one pill with you. And then they'll go, right, how many of you got of these? Oh, me and my friends have got like 20 or 30. We're going to take five each. Okay, you just be aware that this one has got 8% this, 15% that. And it's saved lives. Because yeah. someone will be like, these are a bad batch. This has got something in it from this country, oh, this country. Okay. Pill Report do stellar work as well. Where, um, And again, I'll throw myself under the bus. I was in Barcelona and a guy approached me on the dance floor. I met a day rave and I asked him what he had. And through... Uh, MDMA pills having all unique designs before I endeavoured in participating in the use of that pill, I googled it and went on pill report and got the score and got how much milligrams of MDMA are in it, so I knew what I should be doing with it. And you know, if there was one, one pill could be way bigger than the other one, yeah, but it's for it's thirty percent MDMA, and then the small one's eighty percent MDMA. Oh, so you like you okay. think, well, I'm only going to take half of this tiny one, but actually it's got more MDMA in than the big fucking pink one. You know what I mean? And that's when people can't. 
control how much yeah. they're doing. And ultimately, I think to probably steer away from drug use early in a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> if, um, if you're if, still with us. I think the main thing for like festivals moving forward, one, we want to protect people from COVID, but two, we want to protect people from drugs they will use anyway. Yeah. And in Australia, the really scary thing is because the police presence is so big, especially in New South Wales, so many people are dropping all their drugs yeah. as they go through security. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, that that's not good for anyone. But the thing is, like, so I've never done it, right? It's important that I'm educated on it if I want to do it. Yeah, of course. Do you know what I mean? Which is the scary bit. So if I was to do it, I'd be like, hey, James, tell me what the, what, tell me what the crack is, bruv. Do you know what I mean? Before I What do songs it. should I be listening to? Example. Yeah. <laughs> um. yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's similar. In my, um, I went to, like, a religious school, and they wouldn't tell you how to put a condom on. Because... Jesus. Uh, in sex... Well, edit- you've made up for it. <laughs> <laughs> This is my teacher's fault. Touche. Stupid Catholic twat. (laughs) (laughs) Tried to wank me off, but he wouldn't even show me how to put a condom on. So I just went out and fucked a thousand birds and set up this podcast. (laughs) Sorry, mum. That's not that's not a cited reference. It wasn't a thousand. So imagine if that was on the back of your next book. (laughs) But but like, um, cheers for throwing me under the bus. Um, But the 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 bus comes along a lot. I think the point I'm trying to make is that you can't remain ignorant thing and just say people are going to follow my religion, therefore they're never going to have sex before marriage you can't just expect that from kids in school even if it's not part of your religion teach them how to put a fucking johnny you know on. you know what's really funny about that in east london where i went to school they were teaching you early because they knew what the school <laughs> well, was no, in east were, london no, but they were teaching us uh, like sex age, i think 12 yeah. years old but a banana yeah 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 but same. they were taking the girls into one room and teaching the girls about periods and teach and keeping the guys in one room and telling them about condoms and really it should be all the guys and yeah. girls together learning about both yeah, yeah that's true yeah. Oh, are they doing that now? They must who, be. Who knows? But who knows? I'm, not, knows? I'm not 12, Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> I, bet, I bet in East London now they're like, we're going to count to 10. Then we're going to then we're gonna learn how to put a condom on because people are breeding. And especially right. with COVID. And look, if it's yeah. East London, all the kids are like, would well, have got one on, miss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just doing MR at break time, innit? <laughs> So wow, you know what's mad? <laughs> it's so true. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what happens, though. I know. It's great, mate. Pregnancy rates were the highest in Europe in, uh, I think, Newham or Hackney or something like that at the time when I was at school. Wow, it was crazy. None from me. You're you're <laughs> from uh, you're from Fulham originally, right? Yeah, I grew up in Hammersmith and Fulham, and I went to school in Wandsworth, which is where I old, old mate now lives oh, or, or did oh, live before gone, you. Gone clear, bruv. Yeah, gone clear ish. <laughs> now, uh, for people listening, you're now. Living the Australian dream, as I'd call it. Yeah. I mean, look, so I was going to... My mum and dad moved here 14 years ago. They live on the Goldie. My sister lives in Bondi. Um, she's got her kids down there. So I was going to move over after my first album flopped. So I was signed to Mike Skinner, The Streets, in 2006. My first album came out in 2007. All hip-hop. Sold no copies. Didn't get played on radio much. Um, but I did have one song, which Pete Tong was supporting back there, and Zane Lowe. I was like specialist radio, but I never had like hits or daytime radio. And I was going to give up music, move to Australia. So I was applying for Australia. I went to meet like a, a what they called, not a travel agent, <laughs> a visa uh, solicitor. Yeah. And they've gone, these guys are like, look, Elliot, I know you've got your, your, your degree from University of London, but really, you know, and in this music that you do, but like, I'd really, I'd need some gold and platinum discs. And, you know, or, or an Australian partner. And you haven't really got either of those. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, it's going to be quite hard to get you into Australia, even though your mum and dad and your sister are there, unless you go back to university. So around the same time, Ministry of Sound came and offered me a record deal, which is when I recorded Watch Sun Come Up, Kickstart, Shane's Way Kiss Me, all the stuff that changed my life and my yeah. career. Meanwhile, I bu- bump it in the back of my mind. So I had a girlfriend at the time I got rid of. So we got rid of each other, should be fair. Because we kind of realized we weren't going to end up together and I was cheating and lying all the time and newfound success, new attention from the opposite sex. Yeah. Met Erin in 2011, which was kind of weird because I remember at the same, I, th- I think I joked, I was like, I'm going to marry you just to get a visa. Um, She's looking right now. That side, <laughs> side eye. Um, <laughs> but I think at our wedding, I, t- I retold that story about the visa solicitor because it was like, you know, you could do with a couple of platinum discs or an Aussie partner. I was like, well... I've now got like 16 platinum discs and not only an Aussie partner, I've got Miss Australia. That was, oh. that was like the mic drop at the wedding. <laughs> like Even her dad was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did that. <laughs> yeah, we made her. <laughs> what, um, why example? E.G., Elliot Gleave. Yeah, why, so. My, my oh, initials. Oh, okay. Yeah. For E.G., example. Example Bro. gratia, which is the Latin for 
Example, yeah. For example. So we, were, we couldn't figure that out. It actually says it on my Wikipedia. I think you probably did all your research except for my Wikipedia. No, right? I was just looking at YouTube. You like brilliant <laughs> Kesha, bruv. Oh, yeah. You went in. TikTok. I was known around 2010 or 11 to have just been this horrible, spiteful cunt who I think I think because I always idolized Oasis, not just music, but I loved their attitude. They, yeah. they were always like the way they just put down everyone. But yeah. they got away with it because I had this swagger. Yeah. And I think I thought I had the same swagger. I didn't. So, so Similar off, haircut. Similar haircut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. going to say something like that. But, <laughs> I was going to say Yeah, that. stupid haircut. Um, but I, when I, when, at the time, when I just, I'd been doing it on Twitter for a few years, I'd, I think I had like two and a half million followers. Obviously, I was on radio and on TV all the time. I was always in the papers. And I just met her. Uh, sorry, uh, her, Erin. And then she's just like, at least she got a pronoun, right? Yeah. <laughs> and she's, su- she's such a sweetheart. As you know, you spent the morning with her. She's like, she's so gentle and kind. And like, she was just like, babe, you really don't need to be nasty to people all the time. Cause I was like, I'd be like, going on Twitter. Just like, what can I say? And I'd be like, have you heard the new Saturday single? It sounds like a fucking shit salad. Um, <laughs> You know what I mean? And then I'd bump into the Saturdays and, uh, uh, you know, an, an, an event. event. And I'd literally be like, and I think the Irish lass from Saturday, she's come up and she's gone, what's in the menu today? Shit salad. And you're just like, oh, I'm so sorry. And everyone's like, he's not really like that. He fancies you all. And I'm like, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> That's, so that. she made me stop being a dickhead, basically. She saved your life. Saved my life. And uh, I, I just became, I kind of switched it all from being, I'm going to try and do every interview and be as cocky as possible. Um, and like, you know, I didn't need to be, but I just was trying to emulate fucking the Gallagher brothers or are something. You, so are you like now taking that energy out into, and putting it into memes? <laughs> yeah. No, I just, I'm just all about positivity now. I'm just all about so we, spreading love and, and happiness and joy. Because we call you king of memes now. Yeah. You're, every day I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm interested in what you're getting up to, but I'm interested in the memes you've been getting sent. Yeah. I, well, I've actually, I've got a guy in Scotland who's about 18 and he's, He's like, he started sending me memes maybe six months ago. And I was like, um, can you keep this up? These are really good. And he was like, all right, what, you got PB or something? I was just like, he sent me a voice note. Like, well, mate, let's just fucking get the street. We got PB or something. I was just like, next time I play Glasgow, you can come backstage and have a beer. All right, yeah, you're on. So he sends me about 20 memes a day. Oh my God, um, that's brilliant. And I probably, I, I sift through them really quickly and probably choose like six or seven of them because some of them are just, a, you know, a little bit racist or a little bit too sexist and you're like but I don't want them, I don't want them to stop so I'm not giving him grief yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm not yeah. trying to, giving him life lessons I'll get to that another day and any racial got, one send it to me yeah yeah <laughs> and, there's, and there's another uh, chick in I think where's she from she might be like Bristol or something and she sends me like 50 a day I'm like slow down just like send me 10 3 or 4 will be good I only need 20 or 30 a day sift out the top ones yeah yeah so I've got like meme dealers who I've basically just promised backstage gigs memeers but they're not gonna, I'm not going to be in the UK probably until 2020. I was going to say. So they've, they've got like deal. 400 days of finding 20 memes for me <laughs> for one drink backstage. I think it's a good deal. <laughs> That's a very good deal. Do you know what? When you're saying about uh, getting paid then, well, something that was really interesting to me was, so Spotify has almost like a glomer, or in, my, in my opinion, the majority or Apple Music, the, the model for songwriting and taking tracks to the market has massively changed like a subscription model similar to Netflix and yeah, films yeah. instead of paying £12 for a DVD you know get it on Netflix or Amazon Prime now being a, a music creator a producer how has that affected I mean was there before um, awards for how many albums you'd sold and well yeah so th- I think the main way to look at it is uh, as, as a business model is like the main era for like I think turnover the most turnover ever was like in the 80s maybe like when uh, if you if you adjust you know for inflation the 80s when gig tickets were flying out and people were buying cassettes and then CDs arrived so people were buying cassettes and CDs and okay. still vinyl and people would be buying maybe 10 albums a year on average so there was X amount of billions in that a year okay. and then throughout the 90s there was a bit of a slump because uh, they tried to introduce the mini disc and CDs were still quite expensive. They were 1999 or whatever. And then what happened is iTunes came along. But, you know, it was 99p for a song or whatever. But people were only downloading two or three albums a year, maybe going to one festival and one gig. So people's total out spend a year on music might have been £100 or £150 across all of the music industry. So there was a bit of a dip, I'd say, in the early 2000s. Whereas now, because of Spotify... 
people are because they're giving that guaranteed money every month to Spotify and nearly every human being's doing it, there's actually more money than ever or since oh. like the eighties in the music industry. Sick. So you've got that, but it's more evenly spread as well because there's a lot more before it would only be like you know the top 100 selling cd acts in the world will be making millions and then everybody at the bottom would be broke now there's actually an opportunity where you can be someone no one's ever heard of a bedroom producer you upload your song it gets a bit of traction on soundcloud you've got good socials going it gets traction on youtube that can be mirrored in streaming so if you're completely independent, right, and you've just got a distributor, you might get 90% of your income from streams, the distributor for setting up your song and putting it into the system that takes 10%. Okay. You're getting 90%. So, you know, you're doing a, a 50 million streams and you're actually, you know, potentially... So team make, Spotify then. Yeah, yeah. You could make 50 million streams, you're getting a few hundred grand. You know what I mean? You get 100 Shit. million streams, maybe you're earning a, a mil. So there's bands in America now that you and I have never heard of. <laughs> yeah. And they're making a few mil a year just from streaming. And Sick. they're splitting up four ways. And then on top of that, they do a 40-day tour. So, and they've got their merch. And um, you and I have never heard of them. So the, the business model's completely changed, which is great. In, when I was on Ministry of Sound, who are now owned by Sony, but they were independent yeah. back in 2009 when I signed to them, they were only known for compilations. Um, everyone had a Ministry of Sound compilation. Yeah. I was their first like, artist. And I, w- I think I got 23%. So that's after I've recouped my advance, which they give me up front to sign me. Yeah. And, I, and the cost of my album, an album people don't realize might cost 100 grand to make because you've got to pay 15 producers, two, three grand a track. You've got to pay the guy who mixes it. You've got to pay the mastering engineer. Then you've got to pay the guy who does the front cover for the photo and the styling and the makeup and then the booklet. So there's all these costs that the artists have to take on. The label take on the marketing costs. So every, everything they spend on marketing and promo, radio pluggers, TV pluggers, all covered by the label. So by the time my, fir- my second album came out, which was the one, first one that had success, which had kickstarts on it, um, I was probably looking at recouping 100 grand advance um, plus maybe 80 grand in video costs because I would share the video costs with a label, p- probably 120 grand for the album. So I, would, I had to sell half a million records just to break even. Fuck. Okay. Whereas now you can just put a song straight on Spotify and if you get it right, you can start earning straight away. But the difference is now I'm, I'm getting like, say, 80% back. Whereas when I was signed to a major, I'm Sony, you're giving that, they're taking 78% and you of wouldn't, that. And you wouldn't, you're not with any, would you, if, if you were to get like a mad offer, would you sign or would you want to do it on your own now? I, I, don't, I don't even think I'd sign for money up front. Okay. I'd rather just as soon as that song came out or that album came out, I was earning. Okay. And put it out, and you've got swipe up, say, hey guys, yeah, you can create yeah. a storm. Exactly. You can then, you know, I've, I think in my mind, I was like, people are getting shafted. Yeah. But it, it actually sounds quite liberating that you can do something like that. And I was thinking. I mean, you, the majors still have their functions and like the place because if you're like Stormzy, where he just built it all up entirely himself, mainly through YouTube. Yeah. And so you've got this massive following on YouTube and Twitter. Um, so everything you put out straight away, you've got 20, 30,000 diehard fans or 100,000 diehard fans who are going to watch that video. So your views go up straight away and they're going to stream it straight away, maybe five, 10 times that day. So all of a sudden, X amount of streams count as one sale to get into the charts. Okay. But like when they first started streaming, they didn't know how to count it. So it was like, okay, 1,000 streams equals one chart sale. But then as streaming has got more popular... Do you have less streams to count towards one sale and chart position and so on? Makes that divvying up like a stock market. But yeah, so by yeah. the time Stormzy had sort of blown, you know, he'd had two, three top tens and they were all rap freestyles. You know, so okay. there was no, there wasn't, he didn't even have to write a chorus or make it catchy for radio. It was being played because it was hot and Spotify were on it and his fans were clearly there. So you play him because he's relevant. So then he ended up signing to Atlantic where Ed Sheeran was. Yeah. And I don't know what, what he signed for. I'm assuming it was a big amount. But he could go there and say, this is what I'm going to do. My first album is going to sound like this and you can't tell me any different because okay. I've already proved that I can have a top 10 hit, which is essentially a three-minute freestyle or three-minute rap. There's no chorus. And radio is still playing it. So it basically puts the power back in the hands of the artist. Then he can make the album that he wants to make. And I'm assuming he would have done a good deal. I, I doubt he'd be on 20, 25% like most major artists are. Yeah. He, put, you know, he could have done a deal where he creates a record label, Murky Records. So he yeah. signs himself to his own label and then they actually end up signing the label. Like so then, limit, you, then you pretty company. much have complete creative control. He's now actually ended up going, Stormzy, he's done two albums at Atlantic. He's now gone up to Island Records. You know, there's Def Jam in America. Yeah. So Def Jam obviously 
were home to uh, Jay Z and Kanye and all that back in the day. Def Jam have now called Def Jam 0207, which is the dial code for Kensington and London. London, yeah. So the, yeah. the Universal offices now have closed like what was Island Records um, Urban after the whole BLM thing as well. Everyone was like, we need to stop calling it Urban. It's yeah. fucking black music. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And so they've now got a specific label, which I'm assuming is going to be mainly black artists or music of yeah. you know black influence. And it's called Def Jam 0207. And it's run by Twin B, the two um, brothers, you know, I think they're Ghanaian descent, London boys. Uh, they're heading up the label. So they're the first like, two black guys of their kind yeah. in the UK to be presidents of a record label. And then they first signed in, which they announced in November, was Stormzy. Sick. And they've just taken, so they've sort of poached Stormzy, if you like, from Atlantic. And then so through a, him, they're probably looking after all the grime artists. Yeah, well, they'll start bringing through, I'm sure, a load of rap, yeah. trap, grime, drill, whatever. But it's, it's an exciting time for music in general because it's just given everything's had a real shake up but also because of people like Storms who made it by themselves it now gives other people who have proven they've done it by themselves they can come through and whereas before they'd be like you have to give us uh, 75% now you can potentially go to them and go you're only having 50% otherwise I'll just carry on doing it independent Yeah. so artists have got more to barter with which is great yeah. that, that's so good for in my head I'm thinking like Artists, I bet Mariah Carey kills it every December. Can you imagine <laughs> that? Can you imagine the amount of people putting on Christmas songs? Yeah, yeah. I bet she's so great. And then, uh, you know, like she probably gets a hundred million streams right every Christmas just for that. Um, was it? All I I want want but if yeah. I don't even celebrate Christmas, I put it on. <laughs> <laughs> that's how mad it is. <laughs> I'm sure we can remix it. <laughs> that's how. That's how mad it is. Oh man, Are we we actually I put this in the uh, kind of show notes for today. We were like, uh, you you got to help us. Um, make a, a 30 second rap really you don't sound too enthused oh god what's it about it doesn't have to be good it could be about, about <laughs> it's not going to be good is it <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, oh. You know, well, we're kind of joking we're like we're, like, we're going to make him rap yeah. I'm actually him. really good at freestyling but only I have to be pissed don't I babe when I'm when I'm really good at freestyling I'm usually a bit fucked don't I well what do you fancy gin champagne <laughs> us I'll go to Otherwise, <laughs> sounds like me and Smith. <laughs> <laughs> we were um, e even on the way to the gym, we're like, oh, let's put on his track on the way here. When we arrived at the gym earlier, could you hear it? I was, I was coming down to let you in because I'm a nice guy and I'm a nice host. And then, firstly, I see my wife in the car and she's like, pointing like look at these salads behind and then I was like oh it's them <laughs> shit and then, salads and then you've got all night pl blaring out and then I've realised that you think that I'm driving the yes, car because you yeah. saw my car yesterday so you're like there he is let's follow him into the car park and put his song on and then I'm basically <laughs> jogging through the car park like lads lads I'm waving I'm stay here. down she's there and then she pulls over and then you realise it's not yeah, like, me in the car who the fuck's driving that Elliot's car oh it's his wife and you're playing the song that she famously danced fucking naked to on YouTube in the living room Thanks for that, babe. Bonjour. <laughs> no, hey, no wonder that song was a hit. <laughs> 30 million, no, so amazingly, right, full credit to her. That's, that was probably my last sort of hit in 2019, all night. Um, and we put that out. We were shooting the video in our living room. I had this idea, like, so this TV was in London in our, in our uh, top floor apartment in, in Putney on the river. Put the kids to bed, had a few glasses of wine. She's done her hair and makeup. And I think she was wearing orange tracksuit pants and then like a sort of Adidas sort of tight, tight top. And we did like three or four takes and she was getting a bit annoyed because I'm being all like, I wouldn't say I was a bully. I was just being pushy husband. I'm the director. Babe, yeah. it's just us fucking dancing in the living room. And <laughs> we did like seven or eight takes and we were watching her back. She was like, no one's going to watch this. I was like, yeah, well, you look fit. Like, I'm just in the background being a goofy idiot. And she went, no, nah, let's do one more. And she just pulled her tracksuit bottoms off. And she's in there in her Calvin Klein's and uh, the top. And I think that is the difference between probably what would have got 10 million views and the reason why it's on 30 million views. I, I know market. <laughs> hey, you know what's mad? After this podcast, so many people are going to YouTube in that right now. <laughs> as good. they listen. Yeah. And, you, and you'll be paid on the stream. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did, did you just pimp out your wife? To pay for <laughs> That's how you pay for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> we were, she um, pimps out herself, mate. <laughs> We are on the way in as well. We are actually yesterday. We we met you for a coffee, and and afterwards we were like, we're kind of excited about it. We're like, this is sick. Like, yeah. we we've, we've met people in the fitness industry. Most of them pretty fucking boring. <laughs> I was like, I was like, example. And then we were we were in your front room. Now we were looking. You were showing us some of the photos of the people you met. 
I was like, imagine this guy's phone book. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, I bet there's some there's some stuff in there. There was yeah. I mean, you, you go through phases of like you know. I think like 2012 to 2014 were my biggest years. You know, I did like two arena tours in the space of nine months. We sold like 190,000 tickets oh, yeah, in, in one year That's for mad. gigs to see me. Erin was like coming around with me because she'd like very kindly given up her entire career in Australia for me. She was presenting MTV, Today FM. That's how you met? She, she, yeah, how we met on it. She interviewed me. She had an LG contract, a Toyota contract, Mambo. Um, she was basically smashing it. And then we realized that I couldn't really move to Australia because I had 100 gigs a year in Europe. So she moved over for me. We were all traveling around together. And it was amazing to go on this journey with basically my best friend, you know, my, my wife. And one night I'd be like, she'd be like, where are we going? I'd be like, we're going out for dinner with Princess Beatrice. She was like, what? I was like, yeah, we're going out for dinner with Princess Beatrice. She was like, why? What? Oh, cool. Well, great. Yeah, but how? What? Who's, who with? Her boyfriend. What's her boyfriend do? Oh, he runs Virgin Galactic with uh, Richard Branson. Whoa. <laughs> okay, that'd be fun. Where are we going? Some Italian in town. We were just sat there, you know, like two excitable kids. She's like, How did this happen? I was like, well, You know, when we were at Jimmy Carr's house last week. <laughs> she was like, Oh, yeah, when I went to get McDonald's with Harry Styles. It's like, Yeah. So everyone's like, Oh, don't let your missus off of Harry Styles. That's another story, anyway. So we're in, we're in, a, hot, we're in a hot tub at Jimmy Carr's house with Holly Willoughby, uh, Freddie Flintoff, um, Harry Styles. Who, who else was there? Oh, God. Anyway. The chick, apparently. The chick. Um, <laughs> and then she's been McDonald's at Harry Styles, and then Princess Beatrice comes over, and I was like, oh, hi, of course you're here. Um, and she was just like, her boyfriend's like, she's a big fan. She loves kickstarts. Like, and he was just like, swapping up with her. He was like, do you want to come out for dinner? So she'd love it. She's a big fan. So we just ended up like seeing Princess Beatrice a few times. She invited us to play. This is a mad one. She invited us, talking about phone books and weird shit. She invite, Princess Beatrice invited us to play tennis at Buckingham Palace. No. Nah. But it's the way she said it, this is a true story. She went, I don't think I've ever told this on a podcast. This is quite good material. She said, um, do you want to come and play tennis at my nan's house? <laughs> <laughs> I swear down. Didn't she, babe? <laughs> can, you, can you confirm this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, I showed her the text and it said, hey guys, she'd written a text, I think, to me and you, like a, a, an iMessage group with her boyfriend at the time, Dave. She's married to someone different now, but um, Dave Clark. And she was like, do you want to come and play tennis at my... And uh, Nan's house or Granny was it Granny? No, I said, uh, uh, yeah, my Nan's house. And I'm thinking, did she mean? This is my- did she mean Windsor Castle? Or fucking <laughs> about anyway. But the reason I couldn't go, and this is fucking mental. So we were really close um, to Adele and Simon. So Simon's still one of my best mates, but is now Adele's ex. And Simon used to, or still does run Drop for Drop, Life Water, who I posted about the other week, yeah. my trip to India. Yeah. So I'd gone to India with Simon. We became really close. Um, you know, go to all these villages, providing clean water, putting his water wells in. Anyway, so he's like, oh, Drop for Drop is bottled in Wales, right, in like Pembrokeshire. Do you want to come down to the water bottling plant? Before you answer, you've already been to India, so you're like, I probably don't need to go to where the water's bottled. The Queen's going to be there in that village in Wales that day. To, 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 she's going to come to the water bottling plant and meet everyone who works at the plant. Um, there's a high chance that if we drive down, it was a four-hour drive, you'll yeah. probably meet her. And you can, you know, this is one of the guys from the watch. Right? So and back, that was the same day that Princess Beatrice invited us to play tennis at Buckingham Palace. I got invited to go and meet the Queen in Wales. Mad. So... I was actually this split when you say how your phone books like or how mad has your life been? Obviously, life in Brisbane now is very chilled and normal <laughs> yeah. as you've seen. It's just like you know we walk the kids to school at the bottom of the hill, we go to the gym, we have coffee. It's that's our life. But in the, that there was a time in my life where we were being invited to Buckingham Palace to play tennis with Jimmy Carr as well and Princess Beatrice because Jimmy loves his tennis and maybe like ten other celebs or friends. But on the same day, I was invited to Buckingham Palace to play tennis. I was also invited to meet the Queen in Wales because of my charity work. Well, and, I, I and, then, and then I said, when I met the Queen, um, I, the guy who introduced me, he was like, because uh, you have to say, mom, oh, no, you, you, it's your majesty. And then after you've said your majesty, the, when you refer to her again, you say, mom, yes, mom, no, mom. So it's like, pleased to meet you, your majesty. 
And then if she asks you a question and you have a conversation, oh, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Oh, really? All right? So you're told all of this before. So you get you, a brief. You get a brief. Anyway, this guy is introduced to me. Like, it was a Welsh guy who was like the local mayor. He was like, oh, your majesty, I believe this fella Elliot here knows your granddaughter. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, I know bitches. And I'm, and I'm so giggly. And I'm like, I went, I was meant to play tennis at your house today. <laughs> I swear down, right? <laughs> so, she, um, babe, can you please confirm this is all true? Because <laughs> obviously Simon's there with me, just like, I can't believe what's happening right now. You've just met the Queen in Wales and told her you're meant to be playing tennis at her house. She probably <laughs> thinks you're a serial killer. Um, so I'm then, supposed to be at your so house then I've literally, so the Queen's walked off and we're in the middle of a water bottling plant, right? And then Beatrice, I've basically got my blower. I'm like, I just met your mum because I think we'd been out for dinner with Princess Beatrice maybe a week before. I was like, I just met, met your nan. She didn't believe me, obviously. She went, oh, that's so silly. I'm going to call nan now and tell her that you were actually telling the truth. So then the Queen's left and the next thing I know is Beatrice has called her, the Queen <laughs> and gone, nanny, that guy was meant to play tennis at the palace today. I invited him. <laughs> That's mad. Well, we, we get into gyms for free sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually so glad we remembered that because I've never, I don't, I think I've told a bit of that story about meeting the Queen, but I've never, because I, 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 I've i never told it because I think people, you think I'm bullshitting because oh, it's just okay. so random. But, it's, but I think I've told that story because Erin's here and she's more honest. She's just completely honest, whereas I'm. Yeah. Semi. Never let it get in the way of a good story. I like to embellish stories. I like to exaggerate. And occasionally I lie. But I will never do it in the presence of my wife because she calls bullshit and she knows. That's what she's so I feel <laughs> safe to have told this story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's confirmed with that no side eye. Yeah, no, <laughs> no side eye. No I would happily take a lie detector test a hundred <laughs> times and I'd score a hundred for that story. But that's probably as weird as life got in terms of how famous I got and how mad my phone book was. You know what I mean? As it, and as I'm not in contact with Princess Beatrice anymore or Jimmy Carr. I'm sure if I bumped well, into them... We should them, text her now and say, you owe me a fucking game of tennis. <laughs> <laughs> Any palace will do. Crystal Palace. <laughs> Crystal palace. <laughs> Has there been a moment where you've gone, fuck, I wish I didn't meet you? <laughs> to, to who? No, like, not to the Queen. To like a, <laughs> oh! <laughs> uh, to like a hero. To a hero. Um, like maybe like when, you, when things like went crazy and you were like, oh my days, I'm at a party with this person, that person. You don't have to name them, but it will help. Yeah. <laughs> no, so so what, I, I'm, I'm looking back, there was a time I met David Beckham and afterwards I thought he was rude and then my mates corrected me and afterwards and said that I was behaving like an absolute twat, which is probably why he was a bit office with me. Wow. That was like probably the one time where I got a bit of a wake up call. I was kind of buzzing a bit too much off my own fame and being a bit of a dickhead okay. and probably being a bit too fucked up. And I got introduced to him and I was... And I was like, no, he was rude. He was rude, man. He was, and they were like, no, you're a complete dickhead. And then other okay. than that, so then t there's been times where I've looked back on people I've met before then who I thought were arrogant or a bit up and so was a bit rude. And I've then gone, maybe it was actually me. Were you, like, there are some people I've met who are absolute assholes, but I don't really want to go into it because I just don't, it's not really a headline I just want to get back into on social yeah. media. It's example says so and so. Yeah. No, no, no. But is Because I also look back and realize the people that I was even just going to mention then were depressed or their career was on the down or they were uh, addicted at yeah. the time and I can't imagine how tough it is to do them so I think I hope that they're better people now and I hope they're in a happier place you yeah. know what I mean because like one time I, I approached uh, what's his name I saw him in Soho I just um, yeah and I was like so he's a ledge okay so I went there I, I saw him I said big man I'm a big fan and I thought hey this guy's from Hackney bruv he was short do you know what I mean yeah and I was like I shook his hand I said can I get a photo he yeah. said no and I was like okay cool but then in my head I was like I was a bit annoyed but then I was like you know what I kind of get it because he must be getting that non-stop non -stop. and yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. he was with his wife or maybe he had a bad day and who am I to turn some around some people have really bad days yeah. do you know what I mean and I'm like no nah, I can't just judge that off that you yeah. know what I mean and I'm like in my head I'm like fuck imagine being at that sort of level or oh, even yeah. bigger than that do yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I mean yeah, yeah. you kind of have to keep your life aside yeah right and it could have been a... Go on, what are you going to say? It's interesting because there are, there are some times where I'm having a bad day where I'm like, I really hope no one, no one asks me for something. Like maybe very, very rarely it happens. But like you say, you could have literally just occurred in that one part of the day. Yeah. But you know what annoys me now, which is quite interesting? People have now missed the part where they say hello and just go straight for the photo. And I was walking yeah, yeah. in Bondi and someone goes, James, can I have a photo? And yeah, I was yeah. like, yeah, good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, yeah. I know, I do that. <laughs> Like they come up to me and they're just there, and I'm just like I take the phone off them, like and they don't. They're so excited or like they've 
that one trap mind that they've got one thing as it comes to the phone. You sort of, I take the phone out of their hand and whilst they're chatting, I'm going, yeah, yeah, okay. Then. And I'm like, without looking, swiping up, get the camera ready. <laughs> and then they're chatting and I look down, <laughs> flip the camera around. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, really? Where, you, oh, where did you have lunch? Okay, what was your name? Rebecca. Okay, smile. And then they're like, oh my God, I need to get my phone. This is your phone. <laughs> it's, it's and a, I flipped it around. And they're like, they're like, how do you know my, how do you know my code? I was like, you, can, you know, you can swipe up on my phone and get straight <laughs> to the... Your face. Darren Brown. <laughs> and then you're like, or oh, there's other times where people are like really weird and awkward, like they're filming you eat in a cafe or restaurant. Oh, what? And they're like on the other side of, and I literally, I'll pretend I'm going to the toilet and you see them put the phone away and I just go up and I go, hey, is everything all right? And this happens, this happens quite a lot. Not so much here, but if I'm on a UK tour and every, you know, you're in Birmingham City Centre, Manchester City Centre, yeah, Nottingham yeah. City Centre, it's like 100 selfies, which is great because it's different to in the past where I'd have security and security, like everyone stand back, get your phones ready. I actually myself now go, you want a photo, don't you? Come on, get your phone out. And it just makes it quicker and snappier, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there be, I've gone people passing like um, Wagamamas or something eating and they're filming you. I walk past, I go, how's your meal? And they go, yeah. Yeah, good. Oh my god! Oh my god! I'm like, do you want a photo? They're like, yeah, all right. And I get the phone out and I go into the photos. I go, oh look, isn't that funny? You got a video of me eating my lunch. And they're like, I'm like, come on, you just don't need to film people. I was it's- like, just ask for a photo. It's fine. I was like, what are you going to do with a photo of me eating a fucking chicken katsu curry? <laughs> a video. <laughs> you know what I mean? Are you going to frame it? You better frame it. <laughs> Thirty seconds is like a great interaction time, and like a minute's fine as well. Uh, but After what, that, it's shaky hand, man, didn't it? But what, <laughs> but what I think has happened is I think the people aren't doing it because they're bad. They over-respect your time yeah, and yeah. they want it to be such a quick transaction that it loses its genuine yeah, kind yeah, yeah. of nature. Exactly. So if you are someone that's nervous, you quite happily can have a minute of my time. Like quite happily. I would rather you had a minute like, of my what, time. What's your name? Where are you off to? Where have yeah. you been? Like, yeah, yeah. What do you do? I'd yeah. rather they had a minute than 10 seconds Yeah, yeah. because you feel like a transaction of just a photo. Yeah. But if someone's like, hey, love your, love your work, uh, so surprised I bumped into you. I'd love to have a photo. That minute of my time seems so much, so much more valuable than, hey, smile, cheers, yeah, thank yeah. you, bye. That guy today, he was probably about a minute too long, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Won't name his name. I said this. <laughs> he was from, no, not, I'd say he was 90 seconds too long. He had about, he had about three minutes. Like elevator pitch, elevator pitch, elevator pitch. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Dragon's Den. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We couldn't have been any nicer. Anyway. <laughs> so the good thing is there's no one anyone listening to this doesn't know how many people we've met today so. no no <laughs> hey <laughs> so you said, we said that innit as soon as we got in the car we said the I'm same like, thing I was like one minute too long brother yeah yeah yeah. Like, uh, and my, my wife there she's so sweet she'd be like no he was lovely I'll be like baby he was 90 seconds too long he is. no <laughs> baby don't he was lovely he was really sweet <laughs> he really liked you guys his dragon den pitch. Yeah. <laughs> I get I get so paranoid that we're, we're, we're not recording, but we are recording, don't worry. Hey, what what song means the most to you, bro? Um, my favourite song that I've ever done is called Perfect Replacement, and it's just because it's an absolute banger. It's not my f- most famous song, but go search it out. It's, okay. f- it's also a sick training song because okay. it's like absolutely having it. Um, just because I wrote it in Erin's flat in Bondi after we just met. And like the lyric, it's not meant to be mean about my ex, but the lyric for the drop is, I found your perfect replacement. And then the song goes absolutely off. Right? You know what I rate, bruv? You really love your wife, bruv. And you yeah. seem so happy. Yeah, of course. You seem so happy. And I'm not going to lie, seeing your sort of setup, I'm like, in 10 years time, I want this life, bruv. Right. I, I said, John, I appreciate you, that. You, you, uh, you were in my email today. So I write an email every day to my marketing list. It's about 220,000 people on it at the moment. And I said that when we came round, like, although your accolades are incredibly impressive, the most impressive thing that I found was the life you've created from what is a lot of exposure. You know, there are a lot of people that could have been given the exact same tools that you have and ruined themselves with it. I'm sure a lot of people have. And instead you've constructed a very admirable life with a, with a lady that you obviously love a lot. You have kids, you're in a fantastic home. And like when we were asking about your life, the things that excited you the most were walking your kids to school, yeah. creating new music. Yeah. And Darren and I both, when we Cooking, left, I love cooking. Yeah, you know it wasn't I mean? It wasn't the fact we came in and we're like, raw, sick crib. Well, it is a sick crib. But we were like, what a life. And yeah. I think for us, it was a fantastic insight to show what the future could hold. Which oh, mate, what- I, I always say this to people, you get yourself into a position where you cannot wait to go to work. And I'm like, I can't wait to get out of bed and see my kids' faces smile and pour them cereal. And I sit there eating the cereal and they're little six and a three-year-old like, they're just looking at me like, and then you look back at them and you're like, it's and like they're like, most mornings. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then I get excited to, drop, you know, walk the kids to school and then, you know, give them their little cuddle, they run off and then text Erin, find out, is she, is she running up Mount Kutha? Are we going to go for a run? Is she at the gym? Are we going to go, is she in, in the pool? You know, is she, 
oh she's got meetings great she's got her thing I'm going to go and do some exciting things myself like oh, oh no she's going to bring me back a coffee these are all the little things you get excited about which is basically just living you know what I mean it's not about we drive a Volkswagen Touareg and in the UK we had a Range Rover deal we are very fortunate we had a free Range Rover we had a free Jaguar I had a Ferrari I had a Porsche I had a Lamborghini I had a McLaren I had all these things and now we've got Volkswagen Touareg and I don't miss them at all obviously I miss the, the feeling I'd got driving them yeah yeah but they, they didn't add any th- any value to my life. You know what I mean? I it's, think that's what I like. I don't own any, you know, I get sent free G-Shocks. Yeah. I'm not against people buying watches. I also think you get the right watch. It's an investment and it's a, you have it for life. You know what I mean? It's something beautiful. And it's also so like if you can afford to spend 10, 20, 30 grand on the watch, then, you know, hopefully you, you, you're earning enough to make that sensible. You know, yeah. it's not like the ghetto mentality of I'm going to wear everything I'm worth around my neck and in what I drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I really think that since we've moved away from London and come to Brisbane, because it's so different to even Melbourne and Sydney, I don't care about having the, a haircut every day or what I'm wearing. And, and it's quite a nice thing to feel that. People as much hair. as I love clothes and I love yeah, trainers yeah. and I love having a, fr- a fresh trim, yeah. I love getting dressed up. At the same time, I'm like, I'm happy to wear the same pair of jeans every time we go to an event. People are less materialistic here. Yeah. The, the way I see it is and you have pleasure on one side, you have happiness, they're different things. And pleasure is your big nights out, your fancy cars, your stupid Gucci t-shirts. But happiness is never governed by pleasure. Pleasure is a black hole. Exactly. And it will consume anything you throw at it. But happiness is the simple things. Coffee in the morning with your family, reading like your favorite book when you've got 10 minutes to yourself. Oh, mate, even reading to my kids. Yeah. Like, yeah. Reading my kids a book. Like if, I can, if I'm in the studio at six o'clock and I think I can make it home by 6.45 to read to them, I will rush to get home to read just to have that like with my oldest, Evander, Vanny. Like, he's like, dad, there's home. And then he's like, dad's going to take you up to bed now. He's sitting there. And some nights he's just like, I'm too tired, dad. I don't want to book tonight. Can you just do tickles and massage on my back? So we do this thing where I run my, walk my hand, fingers along his back and he calls them stampies. And he's so cute. He's like, oh, they're really nice, the stampies. Can you, can, you, can you do punchies? And then you're just there going like on his back. Right? And he's like, oh, I'm going to sleep so well tonight because of this. And then other nights he's just there choosing his book and he's there going, hmm. Um, this one this one no I'll probably fall asleep during this one so it's like these things that I'm looking forward to all day and you take them for granted didn't I've, a lot of people say this and I don't think I've ever had anyone on my podcast where I've actually asked them this. does it when you have kids do you change or um, did you change or did you feel like you forced you were forced to change or were you the same you just I don't know you your energy went elsewhere um, I don't know I think you just I've, I've always just been a big kid at heart so I just really okay. transitioned into it really well okay you know what I mean All I right. find it like don't you think you think you're going to change but then you realise afterwards you're still exactly the same yeah you think you're going to change but you're still the same yeah I don't, yeah. I don't I love life more than ever I'm just like I, I'm fortunate like, I mean my dad was away working all the time my mum and dad are still married they lived down the Goldie together they moved there like over 10 Getting years ago. Getting them on the podcast next week. Yeah. <laughs> good, the good content. Um, and yeah, my dad was always awake, like working his ass off for, to provide for the family. And he would drive every day to Birmingham for two hours just to do this job where he was working in computer systems. Not yeah. earning much, but it was the only job he could get at the time. And then coming home and he would get home at like 8, 9 p.m. And then see my mum for a bit, do DIY all weekend, you know, to get the house because they just got their first mortgage in the house and they were the first yeah. people in their family to buy a house um, because before my dad had grown up in a council house and so on. So what he did was really impressive but I al- always remember that whenever I was awake and he'd come home, he would the first thing he would do was come through the door and run up to read me a bedtime story okay. and he'd sit there and play with me non-stop on a Saturday you know, for two, three hours to, and as well as training for marathons and doing DIY and obviously being a good husband and... And and I think that's really instilled something in me. And how good is my dad still with, like when our kids go down to stay with him, my dad will play nonstop for six, seven hours with my kids. That's it. And he's nearly 70 years old and his his health's deteriorated recently, but it's so inspirational. And he's he's still just a big kid, you know, doing voices and impressions and creating fantasy for them to feed their... Does this have anything to do with your new album name? Um, Or, Or... I can't reveal the album name, but oh, yeah. Oh, oh sorry. 
Maybe I, I, maybe I should. No, no, no. Don't. Should I save it? Yeah, because yeah, the album's not going to be out till like July. So. All right, cool. If, I saw if, sneak... if this was in May, I could tease it. All right, cool. Cause I saw a sneak peek of it and I, I pointed at it and I went, I really like this. Yeah. yeah. Because it resonates with me hugely. Um, I suppose, because I'm nearly giving it away, talking about the future and yeah. what the future holds. It's basically, this, this album is, the, the simplest way to say it is it's, there's a lot of songs about with the sort of Peter Pan uh, you okay. know, ethos of the yeah. boy who never grew up, but in a, in a positive way. I feel I get called Peter Pan. I reckon I might drop my first pill listening to it. <laughs> 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 we'll have to make sure it's a pill with Peter Pan's little innocent face on in it. Peter like, Pill. Like not I love that look, she's in there stretching now. She's getting so... <laughs> your turn's next week, babe. <laughs> not, uh, not bullshit and genuinely listening to that, I was really oh, enjoying it. And you, you played us three songs. A four, four. Four songs. You were in the toilet for half of them, I think. I was only having a pee, don't worry. Okay. I would play it again before we go. <laughs> no, yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That first but, song was... Banger. Yeah, it was really, really good. And um, I suppose, so talk people through timelines of when you're expecting to release, what kind of uh, work that is for you. Like, what, what does the future hold for you? Obviously, a few things are COVID permitting, but tell us about your solid plans. Um, so I have got the, my eighth album, Album 8, um, which is, has got a title. Well, before that soon. That's going to be out probably July, August, I reckon. So it's actually 10 years since my biggest album, Playing in the Shadows, which had Change the Way Kiss Me on it and Stay Awake which were both number one singles. The album was number one, and that was 10 years ago this year. Um, the album came out September the 4th. Change the Way You Kiss Me came out in June uh, 2011. So it's, it's kind of like a, that's kind of romantic in a way, poetic, you know, that it's 10 years since my biggest album. I actually feel that this album is as big or could be as big. Obviously, it's not going to be dictated uh, with sales. It's going to be with streams now. But yeah, my process now, I've got a song coming out in March, which is a feature song that I'm on, which is a big pop house song, just to sort of get me back in the mix at um, radio and all the sort of pop dance playlists on Spotify. But it's also a song that I really love. It's like, I never, I've never released anything unless I can imagine performing it. Okay. Because I think that's the ultimate test of whether you love a song or you're proud of it, is if I could go on stage and sell this and sell these lyrics that they come from my head. So that's, so that's coming out. And then there's another single as a feature in April um, with another uh, Scottish producer, uh, not Calvin Harris, <laughs> but there's an unnamed guy for now. And then my first single will probably be out like May and then another single July and then the album maybe a week or two later. So that's what I've got lined up. I've, I was meant to be in New Zealand this week. Lucky for you, um, they closed the borders. So I was meant to be doing like six, seven gigs in New Zealand, which have all now moved to November. I've got an Asia tour we're, planned. We're there in December, by the way, so we okay. might have to go right. inside yeah. those. All right. Yeah, we'll make it work. Groupies. I'm doing a festival in May. I've got two shows in Perth and Melbourne in April. I probably won't be back to the UK th this year, even though I've been rebooked for like Isle of Wight and Creamfields and Southwest Four. So I don't think that's going to happen, sadly. And then I'll be doing Oz New Zealand heavily again in December, January. So at the moment, I'm kind of December, January is my, my main market. And then I'm, I'm currently setting up a sort of sporting event stroke music festival for Australia. Very interesting. So interesting. think like, uh, you know, like your Tough Mudder, that kind of thing with a sort of music element. So I'm in the early stages of that where we're looking at sites to... We could have some offline discussions about this. <laughs> yeah. Because we also have an event yes. coming to Australia. Okay. Um, and uh, we couldn't afford you for when we first did it we got charlie sloth and, okay uh, <laughs> he was he was sick sloth yeah, he's, sick, he's yes. a good dj um but no we, we'll talk about that uh, offline for sure but yeah that's the that's the focus at the moment it's just it's, it's nice and relaxing and i think it's it, the, once i've accepted that you know my income um which is you know predominantly around live music has taken a hit by like 90 percent no. you know i i, I pr we live pretty simply as you like apart from the house like we don't spend much money on and much in brisbane if we lived in sydney we'd probably be you know out three four nights a week just purely because we'd be invent invited to events there'd be birthday parties there's always yeah. celebrations you know which means we'd be less time with our kids we'd spend more money on babysitters and ubers and, and alcohol and erin would be getting more fake tan <laughs> i'd probably be getting fake tan <laughs> i'd probably uh, be waxing rather than shaving my legs you know what i mean so even though we've taken a bit of a dent with all the fan, uh, canceled festivals, like I said at the start of the podcast, I'm more feeling for my manager and DJ and my support crew over there. But we must continue. 
I'm confident that any listeners from here will be buzzing to listen to the album as soon as it's there. I can't wait when, it's, when, when the track is out and I'll be like, what? Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, so I heard May, May will be here in no time. Yeah. Like By the time it comes out, you'll be like, I heard that in... Yeah, I heard that in his house, big man. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, we're probably coming up to about the one hour mark. So I'm Is gonna... there any like, sort of like quick bullet point questions? Like, like quick answers rather than... No? I think, I think the only thing I didn't answer was which song means the most to me, which yeah, is like kick what... starts. And the reason kick starts is, is because it's the song that changed my life because I went from earning 500 pounds a gig to 10 grand a gig in the space of like a week. You know, because that oh kick, start, kick starts was number three in the charts um, during the World Cup. So number one was Dizzy Rascals. Remember he had that really dodgy which World one? Cup song? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah, shout, yeah. shout, let it all yeah, out. Yeah. With some, oh, it was a bit of a mess. Like, and it just goes show. He doesn't perform any set now. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. about releasing songs that you're never going to perform. But I think that was Simon Cow. Obviously, approached him with a load of cash. So yeah, I, get, I get it. And then there was a song <laughs> called "Waving Flag" by Kanan because it was the South African World Cup. Yeah, we are the waving flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah so yeah. that was number two. And then Kickstarts came out, and everyone said it would have been number one, but you're up against World Cup songs, so we were number three in the charts. But I beat Kylie Minogue, who I think that week everyone expected to be number one, but she was number four. And then that, that week, it was like everything went crazy. It was like straight onto A-list radio everywhere. All of a sudden, it was charting in Germany and Holland and Sweden and Norway. And then I, I was getting, instead of just playing big gigs in England, I was playing international gigs. And then I remember I got great advice from my, so that was the song that changed my life. And I still love performing it now. It still means a lot to me. It was written about my ex, you know, might be holding your hand, but I'm holding it loose. I think one of the best lyrics I've ever written, get high, get wandering eyes, all those sort of things. <laughs> and then, but the, the main thing for me is that, is that my manager, my tour manager at the time, my tour manager would work with Stone Roses, Oasis, Pendulum, Craig David. So these are the guys who keep your head straight on the road. I love how Pendulum made it to that, yeah. to that lineup. Like, I know. I can't wrote Pendulum. Well, no, Pendulum won the biggest bands in the country at the time. Um, and he was like, he's from Manchester, and he was like, look, mate, you have, you have one big song, you have a career like, you know, two, three years. You have two big songs, you have a career for like five to ten years. If you can have three, four, five huge songs, you're set for life. And he was, he was right, because Kickstarts <laughs> came out, and I, I'd already written, luckily for me, because I, I didn't have to write anything under pressure of hits, Kickstarts came out in June 2010, a year later, I had a song with Wretch, Unorthodox, Wretch V2. That was number two in the charts. And then Change the Way You Kiss Me came out number one. Stay Awake was number one, even though I don't think Stay Awake's aged as well as Change the Way You Kiss Me. You know, that's a messed up joke. We don't kill ourselves. Yeah, yeah, we'll be yeah. the leaders of a... That beat... Um, remember Moves Like Jagger? Yeah. Moves Like Jagger. Yeah, yeah. That beat Moves Like Jagger to number one by 62 sales or something Fuck. like that. So well, I, was, I was near, very nearly a num another number two record, but it was a number one. But I think Kickstart, Change the Way You Kiss Me, and We'll Be Coming Back with Calvin are my three sort of like timeless classics, which, I'm, you know... We'll Be Coming I've, Back is... I've kind of written by, out, you know, obviously the producers behind them as well, amazing talent, but I wrote them without thinking or putting pressure on myself. Didn't really know what I was writing about at the time. It was just like a, you know, train of thought. And those, I think, are the reason why we're, I'm sat here in this house and I'm still relevant and I've still got the energy to be doing my eighth album, you know? You know when that flipped, right? When that banged? Were you like, this is such a shock? Or was it like, it's about time, bruv. It was coming. Do you know no, what I mean? Were you, did you feel like you, you had I, to no, be there anyway? No, I'd, I'd, I'd quietly told a lot of people, you watch, you watch. You okay, know? yeah, yeah. So there was, but it felt good for so many reasons because I, I, the sort of 12, 13-year-old in me who was trying to prove himself in the playground by rapping, and who'd never been good at football or team sports, who wasn't great at sprinting, who was the last to lose their virginity, who like all these things, yeah. the last person to get biceps or whatever. Yeah. There was that element of you that's always like, yeah, look at me now. Yeah. But I don't know, I was still mates with a lot of people from school and university, yeah. so I'd never really lost touch. But yeah. I always had, luckily, had people to keep me grounded. And then obviously meeting Aaron kept me more grounded than ever. Okay. But... Yeah, I mean, like, there's been moments where I've been on stage, you can't help it. I've performed in front of 120,000 people. Oh, my God. And I, I've had everybody in that field bouncing. Like, I mean, like, there's footage I can show you on YouTube. I've got, there's not one person in that field who isn't bouncing or moshing. And you can't, you can't not sit there and look around back at my drummer or my bass player and just like, oh, we're the fucking dons. We're the <laughs> you know? Like, I'm the fucking guy. <laughs> and no wonder you come on stage and you can't recreate that 
that energy. That energy. So yeah. you're like, where's that fucking bottle of gin? Yeah. Like that. Fucking take your sweaty t shirt off, throw it down, like. <laughs> you, know, fucking, you know, no wonder. Like, you know, yeah, you're single, yeah. you're like the girls over there in the VIP area, you're like, hey, come here. Like, Fuck out. <laughs> you know, that's where that's that's where it comes from. Yeah, you feel right. on top of the world. I bet that right? that yeah. feeling must be crazy. But then, funny enough, I meet Erin and I'm playing Parklife Festival in Sydney. Maybe she can tell her version on, on the podcast <laughs> next week. But no, I'm chatting to her and she, I we've been chatting on Twitter after she interviewed me. And she DM'd me and I was like, what? She doesn't need money off me. She's got her own career. She must really like me. Um, and then I've sent a guy in a, a golf buggy backstage. I was like, oi, oi, bruv, bruv. Can you just drive me over to VIP? I need to pick some girl up. He was like, I'm not a golf buggy driver. I was like, come on, man, come on. He went, it's actually my festival. I was like, oh. He was like, don't worry, I'll give you a lift, Elliot. <laughs> so he's driven me over and picked her up. And she'd come back and then we're sat in our dressing room. And there's about like eight of us or something. I think my sister's there as well. And then some weird people we knew from Melbourne, some dodgy people. And then, and then her show producer at MTV was just like, she came over and she went, go kiss her. It was like the only time probably I've been nervous about a girl in like the, the two, three, four years leading up to that. She's like, just go and kiss her, Elliot. I was like, what? She went, you two are going to get married and have babies. I know it. It's an English chick. Was, that, was it Steph? Yeah, so I did. I just sort of like walked. It was probably the long. It felt the longest. It was probably like from there to there. It was probably like 12 feet. But it felt like an eternity. And I'd just gone over and just gone. Just lent in. Hey, baby. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I think we then just kissed constantly for about three hours. And then went side of stage to watch Magnetic Man. And I was like, I'm coming back to yours right now. And she was like... I've just had a house party. I, well, I don't need to see it. I was like, do you think I care about the house party? <laughs> that is not what I want to see. Um, and yeah, the rest is history. But yeah, mum. Exciting times. Exciting times. I'm excited. I'm excited. Probably shut up now and wait. let her answer some questions about her own life. Well, <laughs> the, the interesting thing is, because we're uh, going to be here for quite a bit more, when did you say the first thing was coming out? May? First thing was May. Do you want to come on and talk about it just before it goes out? Yeah, all right. Um, and then we will... Well, I'll, probably, I'll, come, I'll come down to Sydney or something. Yeah, we do. And we can do like part two. Probably yeah. play a little quick clip of something. Because I know so many people would have found it so interesting listening to career, backstage, Spotify, family life, like all of this kind of stuff. Um, there'll be so many kind of other tangents people just be fascinated about. I think it's so good that we have the ability to have guests. We on. could even get some questions sent in. Yeah, yeah. we'll do it. Ahead we'll, of it. We'll make it virtual. And like I said. If we'll, I'm in London, I'm going to have so much FOMO. You're not going to be... Lo- Why would you go back to London, you idiot? It's family, isn't it? Yeah. He's, he's this, we're your family. family. I look oh. like your family. Wait, Uncle L. <laughs> Uncle, uh, I'm staying, I'm staying. He's, I'm he staying. Says I'm exactly to... 10 years older. I'm the, the weird uncle. The thing is, you know, like, <laughs> I feel like, you know, in London, may, maybe not for Smith, but for me right now, it, I feel like there's things that I've got to accomplish and I feel like in Australia, I can't do that. I need to be in London. To be I fair, to be you're not going to accomplish it. lockdown from here. You should go back and finish lockdown. <laughs> you just don't want me to go. T- to be fair, you've, I'll have you've, to move to Bondi. Eh? But, yeah, Aaron, I'll see Aaron once a week because he hasn't got a friend. <laughs> no, I'm I'm done done with Bondi. It's not wholesome. Wait. I'm coming to Brisbane. It was Brisbane's a place. I'll, I'll be here longer if you come to Brisbane because I'm done with Sydney, bro. It's dead. Yeah, I, I, sorry to anyone. You've done it all. It's, it's, I've done it. I've completed, completed it. it. You've met them all. <laughs> I've completed. I've eaten all the things. <laughs> I've, I've I've kissed all the ones. Of <laughs> out of tens. Uh, <laughs> out of tens. <laughs> Did, Why would you say that about women, bro? What's the wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Brisbane has always had a place about it. It's just a wholesome place. It is. Yeah, and you've got Gold Coast not too far away. And there's not too many distractions here. Yeah. No. The Noosa. Yeah. And then it's probably a shorter flight back to the UK. Shave an hour off. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's going to affect you in business, isn't it? <laughs> First class. You've got too much room. First class. <laughs> so I've heard the bed's too much of a bed to be a seat and the seat's too much of a seat to be a bed. I got I, last last not last year twenty twenty nineteen because I flew back and forth twelve times so twenty four flights. Well, each one actually it's two, isn't it? So it's like forty eight flights. Um, I booked all my flights in advance through Singapore Airlines PR. Oh, hey. Apparently they've got and, really nice. Yeah, but the woman was just like, "Is he really going to be doing this many flights?" And my my travel agent was like, "Yeah." He's like, so I was like, I "Miss the kids and the family so much." So I was like, "I'd be in London for ten days, come back here for two weeks, go back to London for three weeks, come back here for a week." Go back. I was just like back and forth because yeah. otherwise I wouldn't see the kids for like two months. Um, so it was amazing. She, Erin, was like an absolute soldier. Like because I did three weeks when she was on SAS. I did three weeks with the kids by myself, and that was 
one of the toughest things we've ever done. Okay. Like stand on top of the cleaning and even though we share everything around the house, like the constant pat lunches and are they okay and making sure they're washed properly and have they brushed their teeth twice a day and then doing all their clothes washing, hanging that out and then you've got to answer their questions all day and take them swimming and you Smith know and does then, that with me. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that was crazy coming back and forth. And then at the end of that year she was just like, You're in our top fifty flyers uh around the world, including uh including pilots. Um <laughs> so they, they pretty much upgraded me to first class I had business class booked they gave me like a big discount and then upgraded me whenever there was a spare seat in first, first class or you know those rooms, those lounges. No. So, it's got, so I was like, it made the journey a lot easier in terms of you know missing your family. So like, tech, come on, half a Valium, glass of red wine. <laughs> and my whole thing on planes is if you want to wake up with no jet lag or you want to feel good and you want to be able to go uh, land and go training straight away, this is all about the gut, I think, you know, the gut speaking to the brain. If you fill up on all that shit on the, they feed you on the plane in business class, as, as tasty as it is, when you get to the other end, obviously your body doesn't know what cycle it's on. So I think it's almost best to stick to fruit and veg and juices, you know, the whole way and water. That's what I did because I flew too much. And I found that when I landed, I could kind of get straight into the, the new time zone really easily. You know what? I'm not going to lie when I first... Like, like rather than having fucking fillet steak yeah. in you steak and sandwich. potato yeah. gratin and ice cream and cheese boards you know what I mean sounds, as much, terrible. sounds well, terrible as much as you want them I think if you're going back to England you, you think alright I'll get over jet lag in a week but by the time I was getting over jet lag I was coming back to Australia <sighs> so oh, I realised that just switching up the just for that 24 hour window just sticking to fruit veg and light juices and then when and you then go was, there you're doing work stuff when you come here it's full time with family yeah and yeah yeah Raw. but that really helped me get through it it was the only time I'd, I don't believe in fads and all that shit and I, don't, I love meat so I don't like cutting that on my diet but that was the only time I'd do it on those flights is not eating that stodgy yeah, yeah, yeah. and they'd be like, like you're in first class and they're like you don't want the fillet of wagyu beef with peppercorn sauce and cafe de Paris butter and dolphin wild potatoes and you're like well of course I do but I'm going to have to land and go straight to a festival let's get that tonight it sounds good <laughs> yeah it sounds good I love what you said <laughs> Shut up, babe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like I said, we're going to get you back on. Um, Wicked. Buzzing for your This has been lots of fun. Mate, um, I've enjoyed not just today, not just the podcast. Thank you very much for lunch. Oh, yeah. Gym session this morning Mate, and it was so much fun yesterday. hanging out. And I can't wait to go listen to the track again. I'm not going to. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, any, I might even have some lime cordial. <laughs> oh, bloody hell. Uh, any closing thoughts, Darren? At Think, example. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At example <laughs> and... Hey, thank you for your time. And honestly, it's a pleasure to hang out, big man. Mate, for I think real, we're honestly. friends for life now, yeah, aren't right, we? for sure. 100%. White man handshake. White man. Hello. Cheers. Thank, <laughs> you. thank yes. you for having me, James. Yes, thank you for coming on. <laughs> Boom. Sweet. Peace. All right. I'm going to touch them for a bit. <laughs> yeah.